everyone, I'm Jody Han, Mrs. Han Painted, and in today's video I'll be showing you a bit more of a complicated watercolor tutorial or just one, maybe not necessarily complicated, but just takes a little longer than some of my usual 15 to 20 minute long videos. Uh, this one's going to be about 40 minutes, just under, and we're going to be doing this really lovely uh, birch log holiday floral arrangement with a big uh, white magnolia flower some red berries, a pine cone, uh, some evergreen elements and eucalyptus. So there's a lot going on in this one. So I'll break this down for you. Um, I did originally record this without audio because my it was during my daughter's nap time and my son was playing Donkey Kong. So unless you want to hear lots of commentary about Donkey Kong, I decided that I would just go ahead and do a voiceover for you after I painted it. Um, so uh, just be aware I might just be kind of quiet in some parts. Uh, but I'll try to break everything down for you step by step so that you can paint along with me and create a really lovely holiday uh, floral arrangement. It's kind of wintry too, so it's not necessarily Christmas or holiday, I guess, but uh, it should be a perfect little decoration for you to put up after the fall decorations come down. Or if you want to paint this a little bit smaller, you could make it as a really lovely Christmas card as well. Uh, I do have the sketch available for you on my blog, so if you want to do the exact sketch that I have, because I sketched it out on a sketchbook first and then I traced it onto my watercolor paper instead of directly sketching onto my watercolor paper. So uh, if you want to use my sketch, I did provide it for you on my blog, uh, on my website. It's under the sketches, uh, downloads and sketches tab on my website, uh, which is www.mrshandpainted.com. And I'll link that for you as well in the description so that you can download that. I have it as a PDF and as a JPEG. So either one of those and you can size it to whatever size paper that you're going to use. So there's my original sketch that I did in my sketchbook. And uh, there's also a copy of that. You can see it on my Instagram account, which is at Mrs. Hand Painted. So uh, if you want to go ahead and use that sketch, I would love for you to download it and paint along with me, or you can draw your own version of it. That's fine too. So uh, have fun painting along with me. And if you painted one of my uh, pictures from my tutorials, please share it with me on Instagram and tag me Mrs. Hand Painted. I would really love to see your work and know that someone out there is watching and loves painting along with me and the videos that I'm bringing for you. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, guys, I'm just going to quickly go over the supplies I'm using today. This is Fluid 100 watercolor paper, and it's the individual sheets that are size 8 by 10, and you can buy them in these packs like this. I uh, think I bought this from Jerry's Artorama, but Blix has it, sometimes Amazon. I'm using a graphite aquarel water or water soluble graphite pencil from Faber Castell, and I'm using the HB hardness, which is the hardest, which will give me the softest lines. So I don't want to have too dark of a line on my watercolor paper so that it doesn't show through because we are doing a very light colored flower here. So like I said in the intro, I do have the sketch available for you here. I'm just using my light pad to just trace uh, the basic outline of most of the elements so I knew where I wanted to place things. I was really happy with that sketch and I really liked the arrangement uh, that I came up with. I kind of based this off of two different floral arrangement pictures I found on Pinterest from florist websites like 1-800-Flowers or something. So I just kind of combined two different floral arrangements that I really liked. One that was like just greenery with a pine cone on a log. And then there was another one that was just berries and the magnolia. So I just kind of combined two of them into one drawing. So we have like some pine needle elements and eucalyptus and the magnolia flower and red berries. So I'm just going to mix all that together and make a really cool looking floral arrangement. And I do apologize if my sketch is really, really faint here. I'm actually going to erase it a little bit more even because some of that is still a little bit dark for my liking, especially around where the white flower is going to be uh, in one of my little test uh, paintings. I did sketch it out in a little too dark and it definitely shows through uh, the really light gray color and the cream that I'm going to use to fill that in. So uh, if you've got a little bit darker lines, I would suggest taking a kneaded eraser and just picking up some of that extra pencil if you're able. And here I'm having a little pause here because I was actually searching for my kneaded eraser and I'd set it up on the shelf above me when I was cleaning the other day and forgot where I put it. So there I'm just uh, kind of picking up some of the extra uh, pencil just around where that white flower is going to be. And those are from Faber-Castell, but there's lots of different, Grumbacher makes them. You can buy them for like 50 cents at Michael's Hobby Lobby or you can get a whole pack of them on Amazon for a couple bucks too. So they're pretty cheap. And they don't wreck your paper because you just kind of pick up the pencil lead with it. 
Okay, so I am using three brushes today. These are Princeton Neptune series brushes. I'm using the round size four, the round eight, and my one quarter inch dagger striper brush, or I think it's just called a dagger brush in this one. Um, and I'm using my Daniel Smith watercolor paints. I know in my last couple of videos, I've been using the paints I've been making, but I just don't have enough colors made of this yet for a whole set and the colors I like. So I'm just going with what I'm familiar with right now, which is my Daniel Smith paints. And there's my very well-loved palette. Um, I had a lot of stuff on there, so I actually just used this other one that I cleaned off just for a couple of the colors I didn't want to get contaminated. All right, so you can't really see here, I was mixing off to the side of my palette a mixture of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna light, and that's going to give me that really uh, pale blue-gray color that I want for my flower, and I've diluted that down with a lot, a lot of water so that um, it's very, very pale. And I'm just going to do this because when you look at a white flower, it's not just white. You'll see like cream, yellow, little bits of green, a little bit of gray, blue. You look at the shadows of it. So I'm really just going to highlight that as best I can. Uh, I find that white flowers are one of the most challenging flowers to paint personally. And sometimes I do a really great job and sometimes I just kind of flop it. But I think I did okay on this one. Um, I'm just going to kind of outline the edge of my petals. Um, I am noticing here that I did get a little bit darker than I would have liked, but just try to dilute that down as much as you possibly can. And you want to get the faintest uh, bluish gray color that you can. If you have a neutral tint, that would also work really well for this. Uh, just dilute it down a whole lot so that you get a really, really, really faint pale gray color. And I'm just going to kind of... It's kind of hard when you can't see my sketch that great. I apologize for that. I'm just, uh, if you reference back to my sketch, I set mine off to the side there so I could look back at where it was. I'm just kind of going around the edge of the petals and then where I have those, um, where I'd have a petal curving up where it would be darker, like the underside of a petal. And I, you know, I'll go ahead and I'll link, um, you know, I'll actually put the picture up here right now so that you can see my reference photos that I use. Okay, I got those up for you there uh, here in the video. So you can see on the left is my finished painting and on the right were my inspiration photos that I based this arrangement off of. And you can see in that magnolia, it's got a little bit of a gray where the shadows are and there's a really creamy white. So I'm going ahead and just adding those shadows in there. Um, I'll just, I'll leave that magnolia up for a little while so that you can watch that while I paint. And here, I just found another little spot I wanted to erase some of the pencil away from. So I just grabbed my eraser really quick and I just picked that pencil up. And this is just like the first layer we're gonna do. We can go back over this a couple more times with some, uh, use some buff titanium in there to give it that really creamy yellow color that the petals are. Um, and then, like I said, just go ahead and reference back to my sketch if you are having trouble figuring out where the petal should be, um, especially for this magnolia flower, just uh, looking at the reference photo as well as um, the sketch will just kind of help you figure out where the shadow should be on the petals. Uh, and like I said, I feel like maybe I did this just a little bit too dark, so I would try to do even lighter than I'm doing because I think I just got a little bit too much, uh, too much of a dark shade and I did try to lift a little bit of it up and I just kind of thought I would just live with it so like I said I find white flowers be really really challenging and the more we practice them the better we get so why not just give it a try it doesn't matter it's your painting and if you mess it up oh well you can just hang it up at home um Plus, and now that I've learned Photoshop, you can always just fix things in there too with the colors. So anyway, uh, this is a green gold color I'm doing for the center. So if you look back at that reference picture again, you can see the center is kind of like a limey green color and it's got some bright magenta and orange kind of uh, stamen coming out from around it. So I'm just going to use, I'm using that round four still. And I'm just adding those little uh, stamen that come out from the center of the flower. And a little bit of, I think this was quinacridone rose. Just any kind of magenta bright red you have would work. And um, I'm not really sure. I think I was using pyrrole scarlet with a little bit of lemon yellow mixed together for that orange. I, I don't know what some of these colors on my palette are anymore because I just keep using the same ones. And there's so much paint on there. I feel bad washing it all off if it's still usable. Uh, here I'm going back in with the buff titanium. I've diluted that down quite a bit. And I'm just using that to give that creamy color to my magnolia flower. 
I'm just kind of going over the layers I did with the gray. Um, it's mostly dry, but it's fine if it bleeds together with this. I just want it to, I don't want any harsh lines in there because it's a really soft flower. So just kind of paint in to fill in your petals a little bit. You can leave some white areas too. Uh, just kind of try to focus on the shadowy areas of the petals and try to define where the edges are. So uh, eventually we'll go back over this just a little bit more uh, just to define the edges of the petals. But I'll wait till that's dry. Okay, so I'm just going to add a little specks of some darker green. I think that was like a deep sap green and I'm adding a little bit of brown in there. Some that's like a transparent brown oxide or something like that right there. I really apologize for not having the exact color names, but you do not have to use the exact colors I have. You probably have similar colors in your paint set or you can mix them up to get a darker brown, medium brown shade. It, it doesn't really need to be these exact colors at all. So try to just go with the flow and uh, not take it too seriously. Okay, I did switch over to my round size eight now and I'm mixing up some brown to start on the pine cones. So that is a little bit of the sepia color mixed with the transparent brown oxide. And I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in. So with the pine cone here, I like with my round size eight, round size eight excuse me, uh, I'm making some little uh, C-shaped uh, strokes. Gosh, could not think of the word there. So just kind of randomly put them and you wanna do them in an overlapping fashion. Just making these little uh, sideways C's and have them overlap their intersections. So if you have one layer, you want almost like an upside down pyramid, I guess. Well, you're st I start at the top and I make my way down. That's the way I prefer. But if you wanted to start at the bottom uh, and go the opposite direction, that's fine too. I just feel like sometimes I I get too big of a pine cone if I start at the bottom. So my personal preference is to go top down. Uh, that's just the first layer of that. We will go back and add some more layers here after that just dry, just to give that more dimension. So we'll go over it with a darker brown later on. So now I'm mixing up uh, a little bit of some greens, kind of mixtures of some yellow green or undersea green, deep, deep sap green. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and start those, uh, those leaves. I'm just trying to be real careful and go around where I'd sketched other leaves because I don't want to lose them. I want them to be nice and defined and not have a big green blob along the bottom. I want those to look like leaves. So uh, what I'm going to do while that's wet then is drop in some other colors. I'm going to kind of give that a center that's a little darker. So I'm adding some more of that deeper green. Uh, we can add, drop in some yellow or some of the gold, brown, any kind of other greens that you want to give this just so it's not a one uh, monotone color or monochrome, excuse me, <laughs> monochrome color. And just kind of let that flow in there. And if you want to push the color around to get it to flow down into certain areas of the leaf, you can do that. And I'll work on that leaf that comes out from above. I'm just taking care to go around my pine cone and around my petals of my flower. And we'll do that the same way I did the uh, leaf at the bottom, which I'm just going to drop some other colors in and push that around to give uh, a very... What is the word I'm looking for? Um, I can't think of the word now. My, I'm having mommy brain. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's not all one color. It's not monochrome. It's very varied. A lot of variation to it. Oh, there we go. Right, so we're going to be using quite a bit of different greens here. So I'm just mixing up some others. I mixed some of that uh, deep sap green that I had on my palette with a little bit more indigo just to give myself a really, really deep evergreen color. And I'm more of like that eucalyptus that's kind of bluish green. That's what I guess I go for. Now here, if you haven't seen any of my videos before, one of my best techniques I like to use for making the veining details in leaves is to turn my brush around and use the base of the handle to just gently press, depress into the paper. Uh, you don't want to push hard. You pretty much just kind of very lightly press against the paper with the handle of your brush 
and flip it around and then the wet paint will settle right into those ridges that you've made. Uh, don't press so hard that you're scraping the paper up. If you want to practice on a little scratch uh, paper that you've got saved, uh, do that off to the side if you haven't done that before. But this is a really nice way so you don't have to go back after it's dry and try to add really thin lines with a small brush. You can just use that handle of the brush and your wet paint will settle right into it. And if you don't do that right away and your paint does dry, go ahead and still press your line down and then just do another layer over top. Or you can take um, very, very light wash of the same color and just go right back over the top and any new wet paint you lay down will settle into that small depression that you've made. Then I'm just gonna mix up another shade of green, maybe uh, more of an olivey tint. So I use some undersea green and I mixed a little bit of like a yellow ochre with it. And I'm just gonna do these other type of leaves that are more um, pointy than the eucalyptus leaves, I guess would be the technical term. And just kind of a basic leaf shape. And I tried to make them look like uh, you could see the underside of the leaves and then did one layer here with this uh, more olivey green tint. And then I'll go back over with a little bit darker green to just kind of accentuate where I have the underside of these leaves. Just for a little more shadow, give it a little more dimension. I just wanted a nice big leafy sprig coming out of the middle there. Just kind of like the, the picture I referenced had some really neat greenery sticking up. So I just wanted to give it a lot of variation and even though I didn't have a lot of flowers, I really only had one flower. So I wanted to do a lot of different variations in the, in the greenery this time. So I took that a little bit darker green and I just uh, kind of went on the underside of where the leaves were. And I'll go back to my four and I'll do some of those smaller leaves I have coming tucked out from underneath the pine cone. And I waited to do that one instead of doing it right after that big leaf, just I didn't want it to bleed into it. I just waited for that to dry. Um, again, I'm just using the handle of my brush to make a little veining detail. And with these three leaves, I just tried to maybe just vary up the, the shade of green just very, very slightly just to give it a um, little bit of variation. And another thing that I'm going to do here is in addition to making the veining detail, I kind of actually use that to outline the leaf just to make the edge of the leaf a little more defined. So it'll give you the same effect as the vein. It's just making that darker edge. So then I don't have to try and uh, go back over with a fine lining brush later and try to make really light lines. So you can uh, dip in some more colors there to give it a little more variation if you wanted to add some other shades of green. And here I'm gonna go back on this one and just deepen that up a little bit and kind of made a center line to give me uh, something to go off of. And I needed some wet paint in there to settle before I did my depression. So I added some more paint and I'm going to add my vein detail and then just kind of spread that around. And honestly, this was still a little bit wet, even 100% uh, cotton paper it doesn't dry out quite as fast. Uh, and especially this fluid 100 paper, I really, really like. Gives you a lot of workability when you're trying to do some of those wet and wet techniques. I did try to blend that as much as I can when that dries. And in the picture, it doesn't look quite so stark as it does here, here in the video, but it did blend in quite a bit better. All right, I'm going to move on to some berries now, and I'm kind of just trying to experiment here with uh, some different like magenta and purples. And I ended up liking doing the violet color with the permanent red. Uh, I kind of had just a bunch of red and berry colors mixed up in that corner already, but really like kind of a kind of a dark red color and then just add a little bit of violet to it and you'll get a really pretty burgundy or really deep red that would look really nice. So, or you could just do really, really bright red berries if you wanted, but uh, the colors I were going for was more of that deep burgundy. So I'm um, just gonna do my berries first before I do my branches because I don't want branches showing through the berries. I want 
the them to be in the foreground. So I'm going to do the berries first and then do the branches around them. And I'm adding, or excuse me, not adding, I am omitting a small area in the top left side of the berry as a little highlight point where the light would be hitting the berries. And that would be that little light reflection that you'd see. So on majority of the berries, I tried to uh, just not fill in that last little area along the top left side. And that's where I had my light coming from. So just try to be consistent when you're doing your light points on your berries and you don't have to put them on every single one and you can vary up the size on these. They don't need to be uniform and sorry, you can see some of my, I was leaning down. You can see the top of my head a little bit there. My crazy hair. <laughs> And uh, you can go back and look at the reference photo. And I kind of just did a big sprig coming off the top right, one off the lower left to just kind of give myself a nice diagonal that goes across the page, uh, just as a, a nice uh, view for your eye to go across in a diagonal like that. And then I tried to just kind of balance it out and have some small berries coming out from around the flower and the pine cone. Um, and you can always go back and add more berries after you finish all of your greenery and you can just tuck little berries in here and there. That's if you want to put in a bunch and then uh, just kind of wait. Uh, if you don't want to go too bonkers crazy and then you don't have any room left for all of your greenery, uh, just kind of try to do the main areas. Like I said, the bottom left and the top right, I had big clusters of berries. Uh, so then go back and do your greenery and then come back and add in those extra little accent berries in the empty places. That would be a good little filler to do if you end up with some white gaps. And since I'd already sketched it out, I kind of knew in my head like where I wanted to put some of those extra ones. So I'm just going ahead and adding them because I, I knew that I didn't have anything else planned for that area besides adding berries. So. All right, so I am mixing up a darker, darker brown. So I'm gonna use maybe that sepia color. And this is gonna be going over the next layer for the pine cone. So with that darker brown, as long as you're doing a next darker shade, so there's a variation. And I'm just kind of doing the same exact strokes that I did on my first layer of my pine cone. But this time, uh, just kind of trying to cover up some of them, those white areas, but not all of them and not the entire area that I did brown. So that's why I'm using a smaller brush than my initial lines over it because I just wanted these strokes to be smaller. Uh, it would be, this would be what is the underside of the pine cone. Um, I'm not sure what you call those little segments of the pine cone, the little, the little seed particles or seed bits, the bottoms of them. So that's darker. And I'm using a sepia over top of that, uh, that brown oxide color. And I'm still leaving some of the white in there as little highlights just to show. And if you get too many white areas, um, you can just kind of uh, get a damp brush and just kind of blend that in a little bit. And I just added a little bit more up at the top. I wanted that to be a little bit taller. I'm finishing up with that pine cone there. And uh, now I'm going to switch over to my dagger brush. This is a quarter inch dagger brush. Um, it's got a nice soft brush head and just using my round size eight to get my pigment onto my palette because I don't want to smash these delicate bristles into the paint. I recommend using your bigger round brush to get your paint mixed up. So I'm mixing up some of that indigo with that deep sap green to give myself a really deep forest green color, evergreen. And then on my palette uh, with my wet brush, I'm gonna go in there because there's a lot more room to spread that brush around and not get those bristles in there because they're pretty big. And uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and add my evergreen uh, sprigs, I guess, my pine needle sprigs. And when you're going around the berries, just try to go around them and not go over top. 
uh, as best you can. Some can kind of overlap. That's fine. But because it's transparent and you're just going to see the berries right through it, just try to go around them. And I'm making my center line and then I use nice, thin, light strokes coming out from the center. And you can go slowly, but just try to do really light pressure and go out from the center line so that it gets smaller as you go away because your stroke line will be heaviest where you begin. And then as you lift away, you'll have a lighter line and you'll get a nice thin line with the stripes. And try to hold the brush so that you're getting those nice straight lines and you're not getting the angle because this brush can be used in several different ways. You want to hold it nice up and down so you get that nice point on your brush. And what's nice about this particular dagger brush because it is so big, it does hold a lot of paint. So you can do most of your pine needle branch with one coat of paint and you don't have to reload your brush as often as some of the smaller, like the uh, mini dagger brush that I use from the Velvet Touch line. That one's a much smaller brush head and it doesn't hold as much paint. So I do have to reload that one quite a bit. So this one's really nice that it holds a lot of paint. I can't speak more highly for these Princeton brushes. I really, really love the Neptune series because they do hold so much water, but it does take a little getting used to if you're used to um, some more snappy brushes than these because they're very soft headed, but I really love them for florals and I kind of just started using them for most everything now. So uh, I really, really like them. And if you don't have them, uh, just take a look because they're not that expensive and they're synthetic hair. So you, they're cruelty free and that's really great. Uh, here I'm just keep going around. You can look back at my sketch and kind of see where I decided to place those. You could kind of tell where I was going to because I had those empty areas there, but just trying to fill that in. And if you want to add some more little pine needle sprigs coming out from behind some of the other leaves without necessarily a branch, that could be nice little fill ins as well. And you notice we still haven't done the branches for our berries. I'm doing those next. So try not to fill in the areas for the where the branches are for the berries because we can always go back and add more pine needles in. I'm sorry, my hand's blocking it a little bit right now. I was trying to hold my brush pretty vertically over the top and um, I guess I'm going the opposite side now, so I'm right-handed. If you have trouble with this, I would just recommend flipping your paper around so that you can keep doing the same direction of strokes if it's really difficult for you to do the opposite side of the page. That's what's really nice about um, doing something like this. I don't have to have my paper taped down because I'm not doing a full page wash. My, I don't need to tape my paper down. So it gives you the freedom to move your paper around instead of trying to turn your hand in an unnatural way. I'm gonna switch back over to my round four now and we'll work on doing the little branches that connect the berries. And I'm just doing that brown oxide and some burnt umber. Just give myself a, a little bit darker brown. And we can add in some kind of little bare branches here too, just to fill in some of that area around the pine needles, just give us a little other color up there besides green. I'm trying to do some little like crookedy branches and just doing very lightly and thin. And they're gonna come up from behind and just try to branch it off. And if you're having trouble thinking of how a branch would look, just Go get a stick from outside and see how the different small branches branch out. Look at some pictures online of branches and you can see that they're not all straight and perfect. So you can be really crooked and sometimes there's thin and thick parts where there's little knots in the wood and you can add little bits like that. So it's a fun uh, way to just kind of be carefree and not too rigid with your painting. I'm just trying to add some little crooked branches in sticking out here and then I'll eventually connect in all these little berries to the branches as well. just making some really really thin lines connecting up these little berries and just trying to make sure I have most of them trying to get all the berries connected up some of these that are just kind of tucked on the side uh, like those two in between the pine cone and the magnolia flower those are just kind of sticking up and you'd be seeing them from the top and they don't necessarily have a little bit, bit of branch sticking out there so and I'm having like some little pieces of branch just kind of sticking out behind the berries too, because maybe the berry fell off there and there's no more berry. They don't need to all have a berry on the end of every piece of branch. So you can have some extra little pieces sticking out here and there. I'm 
And I'm trying to extend that out a little bit on the bottom left too, so I get a nice diagonal that goes across my page. It's a little easier on the eye so that the eye will go from one point to the next. So I'll have a nice diagonal going from bottom left to top right. And I know it looks a little strange right now because we don't have our vase or our birch log at the bottom, but we'll be working on that here in just a few minutes. I think I have a little bit too much white area in this area. So I'm just adding in some more little branches that would be coming from behind. Those are tucked behind there. So I, I kind of picked up my brush as I went underneath the leaf and then had it come out from behind. So I have an imaginary line that comes from behind the leaf to up above it so that my lines match up. And I have a little more um, empty spaces there. So I'm just taking a little more green and just adding some little pine needle-y bits in there just to kind of fill in. It doesn't need to be anything too formal, but I just wanted to add a little bit more into those, some of those empty places because that's where the arrangement would be the fullest and there'd be lots of stuff packed in that area. All right, so now I'm just going to go back over my magnolia flower just a little bit. I just want to accentuate my petals. So I'm just taking that really, really light gray that I mixed up and I'm just going over the edges of the petals. So that's all dry. So I can kind of just go over that and then you can really see the edges of the petals and really more defined. And that's totally optional. If you don't need to do that, just skip that and you can be happy with how you have yours. I just wanted to make it a little more defined in my painting. All right, I switched over to my round size eight now and I'm gonna do a really, really light wash in that same gray over my log. So I have a curved bottom so that it's round and I'm just going around all of my elements that are overlapping over my log. So I just wanna do a really, really light wash just to give that a little bit of color. The birch logs are generally, you'd see them white and then they have all these black and dark gray little lines and scratches in the wood. Um, but it's just a really, really light, light gray if you look really closely. But I'm showing that as a different white than the white background. All right, so I'm actually going to be using neutral tint here for my darker gray. And I'm going to break out a little palette knife as well. But if you don't have a palette knife, you can use a piece of... Uh, cut up gift card, credit card, any of those. You probably get a whole bunch of those in the mail for free. Those little fake credit cards that come all the time. Just go ahead and chop that up into a couple pieces and use it as a little makeshift palette knife. Uh, I'm just going to use this. I have it on my desk for making paint, so why not? Uh, in my wet paint, I'm just adding some streaks across with that neutral tint in my uh, brush and then anytime I have some water pooled up with the paint, I'm just trying to scrape that across, but not pressure. I'm not scraping the paper. I'm just kind of pulling the paint to kind of uh, give myself a directional streak there. And it didn't work exactly the way I'd hoped because I think my paint was drying already, my wash behind it. So make sure that that's still pretty wet when you do that. And if you need to lay down an extra layer of wash, I just I thought I was going to dry it and then I decided not to. <laughs> so I I wanted to just kind of blend that out and I added a little more water over the top because I wanted to be able to get some nice little streaks in there, but it just wasn't working the way I wanted. But I'm just blending this all out because this would be like my shadowy areas in the back and just have a damp brush and I'm just trying to move that pigment out a little bit so it's not so um, stark sharp lines. And then I'm going to dry that and then we'll go back over it with some more streaks of color to give all those details of the birch log. And this is just a heat tool I have from Ranger. It's for scrapbooking, card making. Um, you just have a hair dryer that works fine too. That's for stamping, that one is. All right, so with my eight, I'm just adding a couple vertical little lines. Those would be like little cracks in the wood and I'm just accentuating the uh, out outside edge on this. And then I can use that palette knife and pull a little bit of that paint out from the edge as well. I mean, this is just a little technique you don't have to try, but I, it's just fun to try some different things sometimes. All right, so going back over to my uh, striper brush so I can get some really thin lines, trying to follow the same curve that I have on my bottom 
line of my log so that it looks round. And I'm just adding random little stripes across there. And I accidentally went over my edge. So I just kind of took clean water, <laughs> picked that up and dabbed it with a paper towel. So um, if you have trouble staying in the lines when you're making strokes and going too fast, you could always uh, put a piece of washi tape over the top or masking tape that does really low tack. Just kind of stick it to your shirt first before you stick it down. And then you can kind of cover it up. A little bit so you don't go over top of um, your white space that you want left to your background so that's uh, something you could do too so I'm just adding um, some more curved stripes going around just to kind of give that that scratchy um, stripey look that birch logs get all right guys I'm gonna call that good I really, really like how this turned out. And if you at this point see some empty places that you want to add some more stuff to your paintings, maybe add some more berries in some of the empty areas, or you could go another layer over your pine branches, add some more little twigs sticking out. Uh, that would be a good thing to add to it. Otherwise, I, I think this turned out really, really pretty. And I'm glad I got to practice making some more white flowers. And I hope that you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and make sure you check out my website so that you can download that sketch and see my Instagram. You can visit my Etsy shop. There are prints available for this digital downloads. I've got Christmas cards, stickers, all sorts of stuff with this artwork on it that you can purchase in my Etsy shop. So make sure you check that out and you can see that on my website, mrshampainted.com. Thanks for painting with me guys.